Okay, I think we can start. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Sali, and today I will be talking about WebSockets and uh, scalability challenges related to them. Um, let me start with an image uh, from an incident we had some time ago. Yeah, um, it was a long Friday, we, we had to stay until 2 a.m., uh, but we eventually fixed the issue. Uh, the alternative would have been to quit our jobs and move to another city. We, we didn't do that, fortunately. And we had a lot of learnings in this incident, but most importantly, it was a wake-up call for us that we need to improve the scalability of our system and the reliability. Um, you might be wondering what's, what's happening here, but before I go into more details, um, let me say a couple of words about myself. Uh, so I'm Sadi, I'm a software engineer and consultant at Netlight. Netlight is a tech consulting company based in Europe. Um, I focus mostly on cloud engineering, uh, cloud architecture, site reliability engineering, and more recently I've also gotten interested in uh, developer experience topics. Uh, in my free time I enjoy uh, basketball, photography, and usually Fridays uh, without pager duty calls. Um, in this talk uh, I'll be talking about uh, e electric vehicle charging, just to set some context, some basics. Then I will jump into WebSockets and scalability challenges and actual concrete problems that we, we faced in our platform. And finally, our approach uh, and how we addressed these uh, challenges. So let's start with the first one, some context about uh, EV charging. Um, let's do a quick show of hands. So how many of you have driven an electric car already? What? That's quite a lot, more than half. That's nice, uh, then maybe you are already familiar with some of the frustrations with, with charging electric cars. Let's take a look what that uh, looks like. So the EV driver would plug in their car into a charging station. And the charging station is, of course, connected to the electrical grid, but also it has uh, an internet connection via a mobile carrier. And it uses this internet connection to communicate to a system which is called a charging point operator. It communicates uh, via OCPP messages. It's just a, a protocol that standardizes uh, the, how the messages should look like and the flow should look like. It's an open standard and it makes it possible to operate uh, stations from different vendors. The charging point operator is a system that companies that are interested in offering EV charging solutions would build. And in the, couple, in the last couple of years, I've been leading a platform team in a, one of our uh, largest EV clients, charging, EV charging clients. And in this team, the goal is basically to provide an easy to use, uh, reliable interface to the charging stations. We don't have any user facing products ourselves, but we rather offer this platform and the other teams uh, build uh, actual business products. We offer features like station management, session handling, uh, authorization, remote start and stop for uh, controlling your charging experience via a mobile phone, for example, uh, firmware updates and management, uh, and so on. And this is what the baseline architecture uh, looks like. So. Um, on the left-hand side, we have the platform services. And uh, here we have a component which is called the WebSocket Gateway. It's the entry point for stations to connect to our system. It's limited in, uh, in, in scope. It just basically maintains this WebSocket connection, does some parsing, some rate limiting, but that's about it. And then we have the station management service where the, most of the business logic is implemented, the, the OCPP stuff, uh, session handling uh, and, and most of the business logic of our platform. And then on the right we have uh, a few more services which are isolated in scope like the firmware service, history for, for time series data and analytics, diagnostics and so on. And uh, all of this is exposed via an API to, uh, to the product teams either B2C or B2B uh, and they they can use that to build uh, stuff like home charging for people who buy a charging station and install it in their homes, dealer charging for companies that provide uh, charging at their facilities, and a lot of other products as well. Um, now let me do a quick primer about WebSockets. So even if you haven't used them before, 
you can still follow the rest of the talk. Uh, so WebSockets is basically a protocol that uh, enables low latency, bi-directional uh, communication between a client and a server. In our case, the clients are the charging stations and the server is the WebSocket component uh, that we saw earlier. Uh, basically, it provides a persistent connection uh, over uh, over a single TCP, uh, uh, a persistent channel over a single TCP connection. And comparing it to HTTP, the benefit here is that the client doesn't have to re-establish uh, a new TCP connection every time that they want to send a message, right? This uh, connection can be reused uh, and uh, you can get a, a rid of a lot of the overheads. Of course, it has a price, and this price is that the server now has to maintain this state of the connection. The connection is long-lived, and it's stateful uh, in nature. And you can read more about it. I left a link there. But basically, that's, that's more or less. It has use cases in a lot of applications that need some real-time communication, like, for example, um, multiplayer games, uh, collaborative editing, uh, chats, stock tickers, and so on. And that brings us to the trouble with scaling out WebSockets. So we'll explore a little bit why is it different, for example, comparing it to an HTTP web server? What's, what's exactly the challenge? First off, let's start with load balancing and horizontal auto scaling. So consider here the, the, the situation on the left. It's, um, we have a, a network load balancer with a standard round robin strategy. And let's say that uh, WebSocket Gateway has uh, four pods. It's a horizontally scaled application. And this would be an equilibrium state. So each of the pods is maintaining 8,000 connections, uh, 8,000 stations, basically. And everything is in equilibrium. But if there is a restart in one of the pods for whatever reason, or even if uh, the HPA decides to scale up or down, this can change that situation uh, pretty easily. So here, for example, pod number four uh, was restarted. Those stations disconnect, and then they reconnect again. But uh, the load balancer will simply redistribute those, and we'll end up with a situation like the one in the right, where now we have some pods with more connections, some with uh, fewer connections. And of course, with time, you know, stations reconnect, uh, and this will go to an equilibrium, but an indefinite amount of time is needed uh, for this to happen. And during this time, there can be instabilities, right? So some pods are serving more connections. Maybe they can run out of memory, crash, uh, and uh, maybe uh, the clients will experience high, high tail latencies at those, at those pods. Uh, so the system can end up in this uh, state out of equilibrium, which can be problematic. The second problem has to do with something that call a reconnection storm. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that stations are connected to the internet via mobile carriers. So let's consider a situation where some stations on, on the left area here are connected via carrier number one, some stations or 10,000 stations are connected via carrier number two. And if this carrier number one has an issue, an outage, uh, maybe a regional uh, outage, all of those stations will, will lose the connection all at once. And then they will try to connect all at once as well, as, as soon as this issue with the, uh, with the network carrier is resolved. And basically what this causes is large, unpredictable load spikes. And it's a little bit like an accidental denial of service attack. What would usually help here is uh, retry with an exponential back off. However, we don't really have control over this because it's the vendors that implement the, the station firmware. And ideally, they should do that. They should implement that retry with exponential back off. But in practice, uh, we rarely see uh, them doing it. And usually, just the stations re uh, reconnect immediately after they are disconnected. And this is problematic. Uh, triggers can be uh, network carrier outages, as we saw, as I described earlier. Uh, it can be even much more benign things like a release in the WebSocket gateway or a pod being rescheduled, right? This can start up, uh, can create a load spike, which might later lead to, to positive feedback loops. So let's look at the implications a little bit. 
the, the system is always at a risk of entering an unstable state. Uh, there is always a risk of these uh, positive feedback loops. So let's say, let's say a large number of stations try to reconnect at, at, at once. Maybe some pods will crash, causing more stations to lose their connections. And then those stations will immediately try to connect again. And this can lead to the cycle, a positive feedback loop, which then the system cannot recover from uh, by itself. Um, another one is load spike propagation. So even in the case that the platform can handle the load uh, itself, uh, the downstream services might not be able to handle that kind of load, these spikes. So uh, th this is also an issue that, uh, that plagued our system a little bit. Um, and also um, another smaller thing, less serious, it's that during releases of the WebSocket gateway component, um, we know that there is user impact. So there is connection disruption. It doesn't make the station completely unusable, but still it, it uh, makes the user experience worse. So since we know this, we introduced the maintenance window rule and every time we need to make a release there, we had to announce this. It's, it's quite, quite an annoying thing to do. And also it goes against our uh, continuous delivery practices. And back to our incident that we saw earlier. So this was also caused by one of these uh, spikes in, in reconnections. And um, it was a combination of factors really that ended up in, in, this, uh, in this incident. It was the size of the database, the target utilization of memory uh, and, and CPU in the pods, um, the load at that time. Uh, but the root cause was something else. It was in the logger, uh, uh, some misconfiguration. We were logging to the logging API and it wasn't able to accept all, all requests, caused some back, back pressure, which eventually led to pods being killed because they were running out of memory. So it was batching all of these log items for longer than it should and uh, it was causing this. However, this wasn't introduced in a release or something. The logger had been like that for a long period of time. What really triggered this is this combination of factors and the nature of the station reconnections and, and this reconnection storm uh, behavior. Uh, so we knew that uh, something had to be done and we needed to improve um, the reliability and scalability of our system. I really like this quote from uh, Google's SRE book, reliability is the most important feature of any system. And it's certainly true in our case. Uh, so reliability is really the core value proposition that we offer to the platform teams. Um, so we set out to, to tackle these challenges and um, let's see how we did that. So how did we address these challenges? Um, let's start by looking at the connection flow again. I listed the steps here, but I won't go through them. It's more for completeness, really. Uh, but what's, um, what's the takeaway here is that in the WebSocket Gateway component, uh, which is horizontally scaled, as is the station management service, there we, we do the ter termination of uh, TLS, we do some parsing, we do some rate limiting, and then uh, uh, the authentication process for, for the station uh, happens in the station management service. And during this process, we save a couple of things regarding that connection in the Postgres database. And during times of high load, uh, what happens is that, that this database can become a bottleneck. Uh, so this is the main takeaway from, uh, from this uh, connection flow uh, that I wanted to uh, show. So there are a couple of writes, a couple of reads that happen to the database. and during peak times of load, uh, this can be uh, a bottleneck. Some quick remedies that we could apply right away are basically over-provision the database. Yeah? Just throw some money at the problem, hope that it goes away. It's wasteful and costly, of course, but still, as a temporary solution, it's, it's pretty helpful. Um, another thing, which is a little bit more subtle, is to adjust the horizontal pod autoscaler uh, stabilization window. So we have a couple of metricas that we use for scaling up and down, and we don't want to react to every single fluctuation there. So because of this reconnection behavior, we want to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, so 
basically making this larger helps you smoothen out uh, the reactions of the HPA and helps uh, avoid these fluctuations in the replica count. Yeah, that's good enough for some quick remedies. Uh, but we also set some goals that we wanted for our long-term solutions. And primarily we wanted a more lightweight connection flow that we could scale uh, easier. And that would also help us alleviate uh, database-related uh, bottlenecks, right? So as we saw earlier, we had to over-provision the database by quite a lot. We also wanted to decouple the downstream services to stop this propagation of load spikes that I described earlier. And also, we wanted to dis reduce the disruption during releases. So find a way that hopefully we can remove this uh, maintenance window rule and also have as little as impact in the, in the user experience when we are doing a release in the WebSocket Gateway component. So these are some goals that we set out for ourselves. Uh, and now we go into a little bit more uh, concrete um, approaches, how we, how we try to achieve this. First, I'll discuss about optimizing the WebSocket connection flow. So, some observations. Um, we saw this earlier, this is not new. The key observation is that the connectivity data that we stored in the Postgres database was ephemeral in nature. That means that uh, we don't really need the durability guarantees of Postgres to store that. And um, if we could avoid storing in the Postgres database, that would be great because then in times of high load, we uh, don't really need to reach out to the database and we can avoid that uh, bottleneck. So uh, what we did here is basically introduce this service that we call uh, the connectivity service. This encapsulates the, the connection logic and the, the, the connection connectivity domain. Uh, and um, it, it, it modifies the connection in such a, uh, the, the flow a little bit so that we no longer need to store that data in the Postgres database, but we can do it in a in-memory database. Yeah? It boils down to memory being faster than, than disk. And for our case, this is a great fit because even if, let's say, something goes wrong with the in-memory database and the server crashes, we can easily recreate the, that data by having the stations reconnect, right? That's, <coughs> sorry, without going into the, uh, the uh, backup mechanisms for Redis and so on, right? So even in, if it crashes, we can easily recreate it uh, and, and have the data back in, in the Redis database. So, Ephemeral data is a great fit for, uh, uh, for the in-memory database. Um, and what we saw is that we were able to reduce the connection establishing time by one order of magnitude. And um, we reduced the load on the Postgres database, which means we can also now scale down to a much more reasonable size. We no longer need the database to be able to take in the, the peak of the of the of these traffic spikes, right? Uh, which is orders of magnitude, or at least one order of magnitude uh, larger compared to normal traffic or normal load in the database. And we also were able to decouple the the connection flow from other functionalities. Uh, for it was we used this chance since we we're revising the flow a little bit. We used this chance to also. Uh, refactor quite a few things. It was intertwined with some other flows like the certificate renewal flow and um, we used this chance to also uh, do some decoupling there. So all in all we were, we were pretty happy with this. It was a long migration process and it took some effort, had a lot of subtleties, uh, but it was really worth it uh, in the end. Um, Yes, uh, but still, uh, another prob the problem that we had remaining is that uh, during a release, we still had a lot of disruptions, and um, uh, a, a lot of user impact when we were doing a release. So let's see how we tackle that. Uh, so, one second. The root of the problem was 
in rolling updates in Kubernetes. So the idea with rolling updates is to incrementally replace current pods with newer pods, right? And max search and max and available let you control this, how fast this happens. Uh, and there are some other configurations as well, but these are the, the, the main ones. Um, rolling updates are great, are great in most cases, right? They give you zero downtime deployments without basically having to change anything. Yeah? Uh, and they are a perfect fit for most applications. However, they are a bad fit for applications sensitive to disruptions like, like WebSocket Gateway, where we have these long uh, lift connections that we don't want to disrupt. Let's see why. So take a look at, uh, at this scenario. So we have the station connected. Let's say we have three replicas. Uh, three replicas yeah, of version one, and we want to do an update. And we'll start by basically uh, killing uh, one uh, pod from version one, scaling up uh, version two pod, and at that point, the station would lose connection. But it will then try to connect to another pod and establish it again, right? And then we repeat this process a couple of times until we have all of the pods in version two. You see, even in this trivial example with just three pods and one station, the station lost its connection three times. It had to reconnect. And this causes a, a, a bad experience, basically, for, on the user side. It causes quite some considerable impact. Um, so ideally, we, we would need to, to avoid this. And you can imagine what happens uh, when there are multiple stations and, and many more pods, right? These traffic spikes, this is also a reason why the traffic spikes are ampl amplified a bit because uh, stations are connected or, or are trying to reconnect multiple times uh, during uh, release with rolling updates. And um, a way to tackle this is basically to switch to blue-green deployments. Let's do a quick overview of how that works. So we would have a replica set of three in version one, and then the idea is um, to switch the traffic all at once. So first we would bring up version two, uh, the same replica set. We can run some checks, right, before promoting it, uh, look at some metrics, and then we would switch the traffic of the stations all at once. And ideally here, the stations would disconnect only once. So there is only one reconnection in total uh, when this update happens. Eventually, we can remove the version one pods and then the release is finished. Uh, we used Argol rollouts. I left the link there to do this, to, to do blue-green deployments. Uh, it has a lot more features than we use and I definitely recommend it if you are uh, looking to uh, use blue-green deployments. Um, the plot here, uh, on the left hand side also shows uh, a little bit what I was describing. So on the y-axis we have the number of total connections and on the x-axis we have time. And you can see that it really takes a while to recover to that normal um, load or to the, to the point where all stations are uh, reconnected. And uh, comparing that to the blue-green uh, approach, this window, this time window of disruptions is really reduced by a lot. And by some measurements that we did, was around 80% uh, on, on average reduction by simply switching to blue-green uh, deployment. So this is really an example where it's quite a low effort investment, but it really pays off. The return of investment for this was uh, quite large for us. Um, and it really helped us improve the reliability of, of the system also uh, the, reduce the disruptions uh, during a release. Uh, so that's the second thing that uh, we did. But now uh, let's take a look at the load spike propagation topic that I discussed earlier. Um, if you remember, I, I was talking about these load spikes that propagate to the downstream services, and that's problematic. <coughs> Even if the platform can, uh, can handle the traffic, that's still problematic for the downstream services if they have to handle this traffic as well. So um, what we did is consider switching or, or switch to an event-driven architecture. 
how many of you are familiar with event-driven architecture? Have you used it before? That's nice, quite a lot. I, th I think everybody has uh, a, a little bit different. Everybody means something different with event-driven architecture. Um, but um, a definition that uh, I think a lot of people would agree is that it's basically an architectural pattern uh, to build services which communicate with each other uh, asynchronously. It uses events. An event is both a fact and a, a trigger, and it's expressed as a notification. And usually by the name, you can already tell it's always in past tense, like station connected or station disconnected or charging session started, or whatever. And, uh, and then you'd have producers which are publishing these events when something happens in that part of the domain. And they would put it in a queue where then consumers can um, uh, can consume it and trigger some logic on their own or simply, uh, simply ignore it. It would need a, a talk of its own to do it justice to this topic. So there is a nice article from AWS and from Martin Fowler that I've linked uh, there. The URL is not visible, but the slides are in SCED, so you can uh, look it up from there. And in our case, uh, the reasoning goes a bit like this. So um, it, it really helps event driven architecture and an, asyn and an asynchronous communication way really helps with uh, circuit breaking uh, between the platform and uh, the downstream services. And we could put a stop basically to, to the propagation of load spikes. Uh, in our case, we use GCP pops up and for example, the push subscriptions uh, have a mechanism similar to the TCP uh, congestion control mechanism so, so that it avoids overwhelming the subscriber if the subscriber has a tough time pr processing the request, right? So it doesn't overwhelm or it doesn't run into these bottlenecks uh, that a subscriber might have, typically the database, right? So, or if you're using pull subscriptions, there is a, a flow control uh, rate that pops up gives you. Uh, so basically this is the circuit breaking aspect that the event queues uh, provide us. Um, Another thing, another benefit of event-driven architecture is that it helps decoupling services and teams. And uh, the, the goal is to have more independent teams and, and better split uh, or, or clearer, better boundaries between the services. And event-driven architecture isn't necessarily the only way to achieve it, but it, it helps and it usually makes it easier to achieve this decoupling. And also, um, the asynchronous communication way uh, fits well to the underlying business processes that we have. So it really, uh, we can model the business processes well, and therefore it was a good fit for us, and it helps us uh, address a lot of the problems. However, there are, there are a bunch of um, use cases where event-driven architecture is a pretty bad fit. So even though you know event-driven architecture is, is pretty cool, you know. It, gets you a lot of street cred. It's uh, right up there with rewriting your system in Rust. Uh, it, doesn't, <laughs> it, uh, it, we, it doesn't mean that we apply it mindlessly uh, everywhere, right? So we really have to pick and, and make a, a, a good choice, and a, a deliberate choice about the trade-offs that we are making. Uh, for example, one of the, uh, the trade-offs is eventual consistency. Not all system can, systems can tolerate eventual consistency um, in their in their business flow, um, yes, and uh, I've listed a little bit of our approach here, but I won't go uh, through all of it. Uh, the main takeaway is basically that to be successful with a transition to to event driven, it's very critical to to lower the barrier of entry for the teams, especially for teams that are coming from a from a synchronous approach of building things. And not only uh, help in the conceptual level, but also on the technical level by providing good abstractions and uh, good tooling around them to, to, to lower this barrier of entry as much as possible and, and make the transition smooth. And we, we had a lot, of, uh, a lot of effort that we invested into that to, to make this uh, transition successful. Uh, so that would be the, the takeaway there. And uh, with that, we, we come to a summary. So there is no panacea in addressing these uh, challenges. An analysis of the load patterns 
an analysis of the bottlenecks is crucial to inform your, your system design decisions. In our case, we went a little bit uh, through the challenges and now I'll, I'll mention again the, 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 the core ideas here. So we made the, the WebSocket connection flow more lightweight via introducing an in-memory database, um, which we can scale independently and scale more easily and avoid the, the bottlenecks that we had with the Postgres database. Um, we reduced the disruptions during deployments uh, by introducing blue-green deployments. We discussed a little bit how the strategy, the deployment strategy might affect the reliability of your uh, WebSocket applications. Um, and also, we talked a little bit about circuit breaking and uh, what you can do to stop these uh, propagation of load spikes and event queues. And uh, that's about it. Uh, I've listed some links you can find me online or best of all, simply grab me for a chat after the talk. And let's now go into a questions and answers session. Hi, hello. Um, you were talking about uh, PubSub as a way to decouple the downstream server, but you're using the uh, Google, so you basically have infinite scaling on your PubSub. If you're on an on-prem, for example, wouldn't you just move the blow-up or the overscaling from the downstream server to your PubSub system? That's a good point. It's always uh, so often with cloud, this is a little bit of a misconception that Oh, I shifted to the cloud and now it's their problem, right? So one needs to be aware of um, the limits and the quotas and, and uh, what happens when you, you get close to those limits. It's a good question. I think um, uh, there is no straightforward answer to this, but I can say that in our case, we did some back of the envelope calculations and we are very much inside the, uh, the limits uh, that pops up has and when we get closer to them we can revisit some decisions and and uh, think about it again but uh, it, it's a very good point it's a it's a very good uh, thing to consider when uh, using this and it would be um, a misconception to approach it hey it can scale infinitely elastically and I don't have to care about it yeah and it's probably even more concrete when you have you are operating this uh, event broker right and you're not relying on some some cloud yeah yes Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk uh, when you talked about uh, switching to red green deployment did you think about somehow making it gradual like creating v2 all at once but then connecting uh, killing the v1 ports one by one so uh, not all stations reconnect all at the same time because you also get this problem that all, can, all stations will try to reconnect at the same time. Mm -hmm. So did you think maybe about something like gradual red-green deployment so you will kill off old connections more gradually? Um, that would be something to consider. We didn't do it. So uh, when we were considering using Argo rollouts or some other solutions that were available, we also considered implementing it in our own so that we don't add a dependency basically to the cluster. Um, we did some evaluation of the options and basically the total cost, cost of ownership leaned towards just using Argo. I'm not aware that Argo has something like that. Ar Argo rollouts has something like that that you can gradually uh, kill off the, the V2. Us um, uh, usually it just starts uh, killing them as soon as uh, the timeout runs out. Yeah, I mean, it, it just you have you have uh, WebSocket long-lived uh, connections, so it's a bit unusual use case. So when red-green uh, deployment happens, if you have standard request response up, it doesn't matter. But yeah. as you described, you have problem of all stations reconnecting at the same time, and you kind of get it with red-green deployment. Um, okay, so you've mentioned eventual consistency and you achieved it through using an in-memory database in between uh, the Postgres to reduce the um, latency that's being caused 
through the database connectivity. Um, yes. What do you think about, I mean, couldn't you like have used a database that provides eventual consistency instead? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, so maybe could, could you repeat it or rephrase it a bit? Uh, yes, instead of um, using the in-memory database in between, mm -hmm. for eventual consistency, um, wouldn't it have been better to use a database that provides eventual consistency instead? Um, so I would say the goal of switching or using, introducing a, an in-memory database to the connection flow was not achieving eventual consistency. Um, it was rather making the flow um, more manageable to scale and make it independent of the other flows. So, so if, if there is a high load, we don't put a, a, a high pressure into the Postgres database, which a lot of the other uh, business flows are dependent on. Uh, so uh, we would um, we would decouple it from the rest of the flows and make it more lightweight uh, and we could scale it independently by just dealing with the redis or uh, in our case redis but it can be any in memory database we could scale it independently by just dealing with that um, yeah so uh, eventual consistency i think it came up later right when we introduced event queues mentioned it as a trade off that comes with asynchronous communication, but uh, it wasn't a goal uh, in itself to achieve by introducing Redis, right? So, um, yeah, that's, I hope that answers the questions, or if you have a follow-up, let me know. All right, it looks like no more questions. Thank you for joining. And